Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And today we have a returning guest and one that was really popular on the show the first time she joined us. It is journalist and cookbook author Anne Byrne, who was on the podcast in the fall of 2016 to talk about her book, American Cake, which traces the historical roots of recipes that have been baked here in the U.S. since the colonies. She has a follow-up book. We're very excited. It is American Cookie, and that takes a similar look at the cake's more petite and casual cousins. And in this book, Anne shares stories about how war rationing, slavery, and booming crops have all impacted the things people bake. There are also lots and lots of fantastic historical recipes. Yeah, we talk about it in the interview a little bit. We talked about it during our American Cake Talk that she has done all of the hard work of uh, parsing out these historical recipes that did not always tell you, like, what temperature to put your oven at, how long to blend something for, etc. And she has figured all of that out and made it way easier for you to make a historical recipe without having any guesswork. Nice! Yeah, it's amazing. So I recommend that you grab your favorite cookie or other snack for this one because all of the molasses and ginger talk certainly made me crave treats while we were recording. Uh, And we will jump right into my conversation with Anne Byrne. So first of all, it's been two years since we last had you on the show almost. What have you been up to since we talked last? (laughs) Well, I've been researching the book American Cookie. Um, Couldn't stop with cakes, Holly. I had to head head on into cookies. (laughs) (laughs) I understand. (laughs) They're delicious. Um, Immediately when you told me you were doing this book, my first question in my own head was, what, if you had to boil it down, is the real distinction that makes cookies different from cakes? Both like the baking part and the cultural part. Yeah. Well, they're smaller for sure. <laughs> and they're, um, you know, they're, they're simple to pr- to produce. I mean, you just throw them together. But, you know, technically, you know, they're a different ratio. Cakes have the okay, have the appropriate ratio for them to rise of butter, sugar, flour, eggs, and whatever leavenings you want to throw in. Cookies are a little higher ratio of um, of fat, so they tend to be a little crispier. Um, they don't and they don't they're not heavy on leavening, so they're not going to rise that much. So sort of chemically, that's how they work. But I think on a different level, cookies are very approachable. They're humble. They're spontaneous, and they're very forgiving which means that you can, they welcome substitutions, which is why cookie recipes survived the war years and rationing because people substituted out the wazoo uh, <laughs> because they used what they had. And and then they morph into new cookie recipes that kind of become a part of, you know, the way we bake today. I had not thought about that. Like if you substitute on a cake, you can really mess up a cake. Mm-hmm. But a cookie will just be a different cookie. It will. And, you know, most people are not as judgmental, I think, about a cookie. (laughs) You just eat it. And where the cake, you know, if it doesn't rise, it's not going to look good. And then how are you going to get those layers all, you know, that are not level to sort of level up with frosting? And will it survive the car trip, you know, to get to your destination? Whereas cookies just can pile into anything, a plastic bag, a tin, a box. (laughs) <laughs> you actually led into a question I'm going to ask. Uh, I was going <laughs> to ask it in a bit, but I'll do it now. So yeah. one of the things that I loved about the last book uh, was how you deconstructed recipes on as an examination of like their regional area and what sorts of resources were available and even cultural things that made certain cakes popular. Is that harder with cookies since they are inherently more portable? Like they can travel a little bit better. So I imagine recipes can as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. It possibly could be, I think also um, probably more people baked cookies than cakes. And so if a recipe was in say a ladies magazine a hundred years ago, it, it, it would be very doable for anybody in across the country. Cakes have always kind of stood as more regional. Um, they stood for something. They maybe were named after something that was regional, a person or a place. Uh, you had a state cake. I think of only one state, maybe, well, I take that back too, that have a state cookie. So 
I I think that cookies are, yes, more transportable on different levels. Sorry, I just gave myself a pause thinking about cookies because they're delicious. Um, (laughs) One one of the things that we talked about when I spoke with you last was the tricky part of backwards engineering historical Mm -hmm. recipes because they're not laid out as complete in terms of directions as as they are now. Does that Mm -hmm. hold true for cookies as much as cakes? Yes, it does. And um, and I learned from the cake book that, you know, you can read so much into those ingredients and to sort of open yourself to that and be mindful of it as you start baking that old recipe. So I was able to sort of take those those tricks and to use them on the cookie book. For example, you know, if you see lard being used, you assume it's a rural recipe. Um, and, and if you see vegetable shortening being used, you know it's after the turn of the 20th century. So there's just key indicators that I learned and was able to pick up on. But I think, you know, cookies are, <laughs> they're funny in that their their ingredients are are adaptable. You can change and you can substitute um, but you look at an old recipe and you still have to kind of scratch your head. There was there was one recipe called Aunt Ida's Wine Drops. And I found it scribbled in handwriting in the back of an old book, which was a digitized copy at the West Virginia Library. And I kept looking for the wine. <laughs> there isn't wine. Aunt Ida would make them to serve with wine, uh-huh. <laughs> because and that it's it is a, in, in, with an old recipe. It's what happens. You're given the ingredients, and then you've got a lot of um, thinking. You got to think through and and finish the story. And I know you often do many, many, many passes at a recipe before you feel like you have have figured it out and nailed it when you're trying to recreate historical ones. Uh, was there one that was the hardest to replicate for you? Hmm. Yes, probably those, something similar to the wine drops, which are called rocks. Literally, they are called rocks. And <laughs> How appetizing. They, they, they're very appetizing, right? But people, you know, people didn't, that's a good example. People didn't go to a lot of trouble to name a cookie recipe like they did a cake recipe. They just call it a rock because it looked like a rock. It was just had a lot of chopped nuts and dried fruit in it, and it probably had way too much flour, and it was blobbed on and dropped onto the, the baking sheet, and it looked like a rock. And when it baked, it really didn't move a whole lot, and it baked up like a rock. So I think making those, and I knew that they were important part of the cookie story in America, for lots of different reasons. And so I wanted the rocks to taste good. (laughs) So I took a lot of attempts at the rocks. That's one example. There were many others. Yeah. Uh, And you also included some items in this book that I might not normally consider a cookie, like peanut brittle is in there and saltwater Mm -hmm. taffy is in there. Uh, How did you decide which ones you were comfortable putting under the umbrella of your book being named for cookies versus which which were too much of a candy for you to exclude? <laughs> well, the, the full story is that initially this book started out to be um, named American Bites, and it would be all these sweet tastes and bites of America. And that was the working title. And as I got into it, the majority of these were cookies. But then there was that little 10% that were not cookies. They were the Dutch Oli Cokes, the donuts, the first donuts, and they were peanut brittle. And and so essentially they were fried things and they were candy. And I thought, gosh, you know, these are too important to, like, exclude. Um, So I sort of snuck them in at the back of the book. Um, (laughs) It's sort of, it's a bonus chapter. And so if... And, and what I love about those combining those types of recipes in one chapter is that they both involve fearlessness. Because I think to fry and to candy, you have to be somewhat fearless. And you, you have to steal up and you have to make it. And you need the, you know, the thermometer to tell you if the oil is, is hot enough or if the sugar mixture has gotten to the right point to take it off the stove and making candy. I just didn't want to exclude them. So, no, you're right. They're not cookies, but they're there in the book as a bonus. Now, do do you think, or did your research indicate that those kinds of confections that maybe aren't cookies still had influence over, you know, maybe cookie making or even cake making or other parts of American cuisine? 
ask a question. I don't know if they had influence, but they definitely have an important part in American cuisine because they typically were made for income, and they were made by people who needed to make rent that month. So think about New Orleans. Think about the street vendors, a woman who may be supporting a number of children. And how did she make money? She made beignets or collas you know, made out of rice, Mm -hmm. and would fry them and put them in a basket and bring them warm to to the cathedral when Mass was letting out. and People were hungry after fasting, and they bought her wares, so it was income. And the same was true in New Orleans for making pralines. Oh, yeah. And it's, so I think they were too important of a street food for me to leave them out of the book, and so that's why they're there. Maybe they'll evolve into something else. Because I think it's really important, not only because of the methods that you need to make candy and fry things, but because look at the people who who needed to make them and who knew how to make them. That's pretty amazing. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, it's people that needed to be able to get an income because that to mm-hmm. me would be what would bridge the gap of being brave enough to deal with hot molten sugar, which to me is one of the most terrifying substances alive. <laughs> yeah, that's a real. Uh, yes, and you're exactly right, and that is a really good point. And <laughs> and not only they had to do it, they had to do it, and they could do it. And they, other people did not know how to do it, and yet those confections were delicious. So there was a market for them. I feel like we absolutely uh, we talked about it last time a little bit, but now in a different light, we have to talk about gingerbread. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go back to gingerbread. Yeah, yeah, well, because one, it's delicious. But two, we talked about, um, you know, gingerbread in cake form uh, mm-hmm. when you included it in American cake. And, of course, gingerbread has to make an appearance in an American cookies book. Um, I'm curious, what were the factors that contributed to it taking those two separate forms? Like what might lead someone down the cookie path versus the cake path as they develop something? Well, probably originally they were the same form. And if you look back at the core ingredients of gingerbread, it's some sort of flour, some sort of sweetener, which originally would have been British treacle, which then became American American made molasses. And then you have your your if you use leavening, it back in old recipes it was very crude and very bitter, pearl ash, potash. So you had to mask that bitter flavor with spices. And that's why Pearl ash and potash worked so well in gingerbread recipes because they could be masked by spices. And then you would have some kind of react, you need some sort of acidic ingredient in there to react with that that base, that neutral um, pearl ash, potash leavening. And so that could have been molasses, which is acidic, um, and also buttermilk. Oh. Uh, so, or, or clabbered milk from the farm. So you had an acidic ingredient, you, so you had leavening, you had rice. So I, don't, I think gingerbread, and, and, and really in my research found that gingerbread was just gingerbread. The Dutch were the ones who gave us the mindset of a cookie, and the British brought over the jumbles in the form of what we know as sugar cookies. So the crispness of a cookie became sort of di- to distinguish itself from gingerbread. But gingerbread was made in very hearty, almost bread-like by, you know, in New Orleans, the stage planks, they're called. They would sell those down at the, do- at the port. And people would, put, people would put rum in gingerbread and turn them into cookies called Joe Frogger's. And there were gingerbread recipes from all different kinds of regions and backgrounds. Um, and you look at the basis for so many spice cookies, and essentially, really, it's a gingerbread. It's a gingerbread cookie. It does it have white sugar versus molasses, or did it would did it become a depression cookie like a crybaby and use corn syrup because sugar was rationed? So the the most basic American cake and probably the most basic American cookie is the gingerbread. So Tracy, one of my friends gifted me with a bottle of chocolate rum a while back. Um, and I have not used much of it because I'm not much of a rum drinker. But now I 100% want to use it in a batch of Joe Froggers. That sounds like a great plan. Anne is actually going to talk a little bit more about gingerbread in just a moment. And she gives a little tip on making gingerbread suitable for building houses. First, we are going to pause, though, for a quick sponsor break. 
One, I wanted to ask you, were there any evolutions of the gingerbread cookie since you mentioned that it took many different forms and, you know, spice cookies are also very much mm-hmm. uh, of that same origin point. Were there any of the, the evolutionary developments in it that surprised you? Did you ever stumble across a recipe and go, that is interesting? Um, probably the Joe Frogger's recipe, and that is a New England recipe. It's old, you know, it has rum in it, and it's got all these kind of folk stories on did it start at this tavern, and did they put rum in it because it was the tavern and they had rum available, which is yes. Um, I think that that was, that was such a good story. That recipe was really hard in the kitchen to get it to work because it had so much rum in it, it kept spreading out on the pan. <laughs> and they do make really big cookies, but boy, the next day, they're so delicious. That rum really keeps the, the cookie moist, um, and they're a, lot of, they're a lot of fun. I think in modern-day baking, we just don't see as many gingerbread cookies as we used to. Uh, the very first recipe in the book is one of my favorites. And it is a family recipe that was shared with me, and it is a recipe that is still baked today. And it's example how a gingerbread cookie has um, has evolved through the years and through different generations. And it's Grandma Hartman's molasses cookies. It is a gingerbread, and Grandma Hartman might have used was was um, was Amish, and they may have used lard in it. At one point, special occasions, um, they might have used butter, but they began to use vegetable shortening as the next generation came about. And then this, this young woman who shared the recipe with me doesn't want to make them with vegetable shortening anymore, and she makes them with butter. So it's a great example how a basic gingerbread cookie has kind of has lasted in a family. It's a great story. It is interesting. I think uh, you mentioned that gingerbread cookies aren't made as much anymore. And I think there's this weird fear of them. Like people have the perception that they're very hard to make and that they don't turn out well very often. But they're I've made them a few times. I'm not a pro, but I can usually get a cookie to come out of it. <laughs> yeah. Are you talking about like a drop cookie or are you talking like a molded, like a cut cookie? I mean, I've done both. Uh, mm-hmm. What usually ends up happening is that I try to do a molded cookie and then I know those may break coming out of the mold. So I also just make some flat ones nearby and let those bake just because I also want to munch on them while I build the house. <laughs> That's true. Well, okay, building the house. There you go. To to build a house out of gingerbread, the gingerbread has to be pretty sturdy. And to be sturdy, it has to have a good bit of flour in it, which is how the, the the original gingerbread cookies, that's how they were made. They had a lot of flour in them. And the reason for that is that people, there was no refrigeration. So, you know, people were adding flour to a cookie dough and to make it workable and to roll it out, you couldn't chill the dough. You couldn't let it rest in the fridge overnight. Um, you couldn't, you know, put it cold on the counter and start sort of, gradually working it. No, it was just sticky. And you think about making those in the summertime or with no air conditioning, no refrigeration. So what did you do? You kept adding flour to it to make it workable. I mean, my grandmother made cookies this way. And I remember, and I remember her cookies were delicious, but they were dry. Right. And it was because she used more flour than we would use today. And we can get away with less flour because of refrigeration. Uh, I also want to go back a little bit. You mentioned uh, the British culture bringing the sugar cookie over. Mm-hmm. Um, and to me, the like a sugar cookie is so ubiquitous. It seems like kind of your standard. <laughs> if someone said, I want a cookie, and they gave you no specifics, you'd probably go with sugar <laughs> cookie to be safe. Um, yeah. Is that one that has multiple different starting points, or is it pretty a pretty clear path? I mean, I think it's the original ones were, were pretty pretty basic. You had flour and white sugar and butter. And and if you had any flavoring at all, and, and maybe an egg, probably the sugar cookies, most all of them did early have an egg, but some recipes, the Dutch recipes, do not have eggs in them. And so the egg will make it snap. Uh, egg keeps it uh, snappier, for a lack of a better word. And, and the egg, without an egg, it's snappier. With an egg, it makes it sort of brown better and cakier. And then you would have had them flavored with lemon or lavender Mm. or 
crushed coriander seeds, caraway seeds. Those would have been the early flavoring for something like a sugar cookie. So I think there was a basis, but then it just exploded because depending on, again, where you lived, what you used, um, what was available at the time, and then did you start using, did you start adding uh, leavening to it? And leavening changed the texture of the original jumble, the English sugar cookie, into what we know today as a tea cake. Ah. Um, so, that, so did the, you also mentioned Dutch sugar cookies. Is there a clear mm-hmm. origin point of where sugar cookies started since they are so basic? I think that I don't, I, I bet they were being made. I don't have that particular answer, but my, my educated guess is that they were being made long ago in both England and Germany as when also in the Netherlands. Any place where people, where there was baking, where there were those basic ingredients, which was just flour and sugar and eggs and butter, you would have had what you needed to make a sugar cookie. And ironically, sugar cookies have remained the American favorite because the ingredients are so basic, but at times through our history were rationed or were unavailable. And if um, a lot of what I read said that, you know, people may have, they got through periods with a sugar cookie or they ate oatmeal cookies, you know, because you were supposed to save the wheat for the troops and bake with oats. But when it comes down to it, it if they had their pick, their favorite cookie is the sugar cookie. Because it's delicious. It's basic <laughs> and delicious. Yeah, it is. Um, and I've got several really good recipes in the book. Yes, Cousin indeed. Cousin Irene's sugar cookie is terrific, as is the first Girl Scout cookie is a great little recipe. Oh, good to know. Oh, there's so much mm-hmm. baking in my future. Um, <laughs> since the United States is such a melting pot, mm-hmm. uh, has it developed its own sort of cookie identity as a whole, apart from those of other countries, or does it remain kind of a, a globally influenced landscape, for lack of a better word? That's interesting. Um, I would say that Americans are known throughout the world as being good cookie bakers, and cookies have definitely been a part of our foodways and our story uh, throughout history. We do it well, and we do a, like, because of the melting pot we do an array of cookies from gingerbread to anise flavored biscochitos from New Mexico mm. to chocolate chip, the revered chocolate chip, to the sugar cookies, like you mentioned, to meringue cookies, macaroons. They are so variable. And because we are a melting pot and so many different cultures came here and brought their traditions, Scandinavian pepper nuts, we have this vast cookie jar. And it's just, it's very exciting. It was fun to research. Coming up, we actually still have a whole lot more from Anne, including a recipe that traveled to the U.S. through the slave trade. And she'll talk about how the combination of an overabundant crop and World War I led to some innovations in baking with bananas. First, we're going to hear from another sponsor that keeps the show going. One of the things that I love that you included was recipes and discussion of cookies that traveled to the U.S. from Africa via the slave trade. Will you talk a little bit about those? Yes. Well, you talk about the Benny, the Benny Steve, the Benny Wafers. Yes. I think, you know, looking at old recipes, you have you. The first step is to look at the ingredients because you're not going to get a method, and so it was very. very important for me to include recipes in here that were ingredient driven. And if you looked at them, you said, well, that recipe came from a specific area. But those Benny, you know, the Benny seeds are critical to making that cookie. You can make them with sesame seeds, but it, they're much better if you order the Benny seeds. And now, and they originally did come from Africa with the slave trade, but you can find the Benny seeds in local markets today in South Carolina. Uh, you can mail order them if you want to. And some, and I have actually have friends in Charleston who grow the Benny plants in their backyard. 
but they have they're smaller than a sesame seed and they have but they have that kind of nutty flavor and they're really just I think they're just lovely and and the whole idea of somebody putting seeds in their pocket Holly and traveling and bringing those seeds here and planting that those seeds and the slaves did that and they planted those seeds and you know to produce a plant um, that was originally um, cultivated for oil, for salad oil. How common is the origin of something like that obscured? Like, was it, is, has it always been known that those basically, those Benny seeds came over in the pockets of people who had been taken for slavery? Or did it take a little while to figure out that that was really what started this? I think probably it took a while to figure out, but I think it's known that they were always linked to um, to to the cooks and the slaves of the Low Country, those were the cooks who were industrious. And just like in researching American cake, I found that you know those recipes that take a little bit of care and take a little bit of time, and if they come from the Deep South, they were most often made by the um, by the help by the enslaved people. Now cookies are a little bit more. Um, E- easier to prepare, let's say that. Um, much easier than, say, making the seven-minute frosting or, or creating a pound cake, actually beating a pound cake by hand without a KitchenAid, cracking a coconut and, and shredding it. Um, the, you know, baking cakes in America was a, was a task, was a physical task. Cookies, not as much so, but they still have a story. So uh, one of my very favorite cookies is the oatmeal cookie, which you had mentioned has an interesting history of its own. Uh, Will you talk about that a little bit? Yes, I love oatmeal cookies too. You know, oatmeal has been popular in baking for, oh gosh, 150 years or more, but it became more of a common ingredient um, when, when flour was rationed for World War I. So that's when cooks were were encouraged to add more oats to their bread recipes and their cookie recipes. Kind of harder with a cake. Um, And it became, oatmeal cookies became very patriotic. They became a wheat-saving recipe in America. So Quaker just, of course, picked up on that. The oatmeal cookie that we associate with Quaker is the vanishing oatmeal cookie. I think it's been on the side of the canister since about 1939. it took a while. The first recipe with oatmeal was an oat cake, probably not as popular. <laughs> the oatmeal cookie has lasted a lot longer. Yeah, we're not really seeing much oat cake in bakeries today. <laughs> not many oat cakes, yeah. <laughs> um, so I will confess to you that in my love of oatmeal cookies, what I hate is an oatmeal raisin cookie because I don't like fruit added to my stuff. Um, uh-huh. But there's a good reason for it. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Dried fruit pops up in so many cookie recipes. And you wonder, did they did they just use more dried fruit in throughout history? And the answer is yes, they did. Um, it was available. People used and got accustomed to dried fruit because of sugar rationing. So more, when sugar was not available to go in cookies, these uh, industrious cooks would turn to raisins or dates um, and use them, oftentimes coconut. Um, just anything that would have been sweet or was used in place of sugar. Also, the, and they found that the more dried fruits or dried nuts, say you lived in an area where black walnut trees are in your backyard, the more black walnuts that you added to the to the dough, the further the dough would go and the more cookies you could make. Uh, That gets back to the rock. The rock cookies we talked about (laughs) earlier. And just like in fruit cakes that are that same genre, the more dried fruit you put in a cookie, the more moist it is. And it keeps longer. So without without refrigeration or or even having a freezer, people could store uh, cookies that had oatmeal raisin cookies would keep longer and taste more moist and retain moisture than just a plain old oatmeal cookie. Oh, now, there is a, a fruit-based recipe in your book that to me is really fascinating uh, because it has a connection to Hawaii. And will you yes. talk it's, about how that came about? 
Yes, it's a banana drop cookie, and um, I was just uncovered this the story um, when I was researching World War One recipes that in uh, about 1917 in Hawaii there was just a a huge uh, banana crop, just a boom. But as the U.S. had entered World War One, the transport ships were not available to take these this big harvest of bananas to the mainland, so the bananas were sitting. And they were sitting. And so there's a, a great story about how the agricultural um, experiment station there got on board. The wife of actually the director got in the kitchen and started trying to create everything she could with bananas. <laughs> they even asked Hawaiians to eat a banana a day instead of a slice of bread. That, back to the patriotic, that it was more patriotic to eat a banana than it would be. <laughs> Save the bread for the troops. Um, that all, cha- you know, refrigerated transport ships um, were really had had turned the whole banana industry around all over the world and actually helped the meat industry as well because it, they they came about in the 1890s. So refrigerated transport was available, these steamships. Uh, but when we went into uh, World War One, those ships were needed for the war effort. And you kind of lead into another question, which is that uh, you talk a lot about the distinction of a war cookie versus other cookies. Um, Is there like a a shorthand way that somebody who's maybe looking at old recipes would instantly know what a war cookie was based on the ingredients? Definitely. You can look at the ingredients and if it has dates, back to the dried fruit, dates, prunes. I'd eat a prune, you know, think of the prune cake, but prunes, dates, coconut, um, sweeteners. Like uh, corn syrup would have been used. Vegetable shortening, margarine used instead of butter. Yeah, those are like tip-off oats uh, that that the cookie came out of the war. And a lot of the no-bake cookies that are still popular in some families. And actually, I've found that some of the no-bakes are, are have roots in Appalachia. Uh, that they uh, also came out of the war effort, but they were war cookies that were handed down generations. And they might be, they might have oats or later peanut butter or dates in them. And it was just sort of a thick batter um, that was sort of rolled together and, and they don't go in the oven. It's interesting. You kind of sparked my uh, brain regarding another question that I was not thinking about, but now I am. Mm -hmm. At what point did peanut butter get introduced into cookies? Peanut butter was really introduced in the 1930s into cookies as part of the school lunch program. So I think that's a really fascinating era of our history, American history, because the 30s, a lot of people were out of work. Women in particular needed to work. And, um, and families were on hard times. So the federal government got involved and created the subsidized school lunch program. Uh, w- doing that, they also started employing women in school cafeterias who became the lunch ladies. Um, and what happens when you bring women into the kitchen? They get creative. <laughs> and they started using ingredients that were available. Maybe they were a subsidized ingredient. They had a whole lot of it. Uh, what are you going to do with it? You're going to make something. And when, in the case of peanut butter, they turned those into some of the first peanut butter cookie recipes. Um, plus, those cookies were made with vegetable shortening. It was sort of the fat of the times, and it was perfect for school lunch because it was shelf stable. So they could bake those. They were shelf stable. The children loved them. And I, in that photo is on the cover of the book because to me. That really says it all about American cookie. I mean, we cookies are made by everybody. They're for everybody. They came out of creativity and hard time. And they're just so unapologetic. I mean, we just love them. Oh, the best. It's funny because I associate peanut butter cookies with school lunches. But I just thought that was because that was what my schools always served, not realizing that was, in fact, where they originated. <laughs> it is where they originated. And it's so interesting now uh, that, you know, peanut butter cannot be served in many school lunchrooms because of allergic reactions. A lot of kids are allergic. Uh, so we've come kind of, you know, we're not seeing it as much. Um, I asked a similar question when we talked about cake 
Uh, so I will ask it again in relation to cookies. Uh, what would you suggest as a good cookie to start with for people who maybe want to try a little historical baking, but they're not super experienced or not feeling terribly confident about it yet? Hmm. Well, you could go down different avenues. We talked about the ginger-based cookies. So, you know, I would say start with the first recipe in the book, which is Grandma Hartman's molasses cookies, and see how a multi-generational family recipe can be adapted in so many ways. And then with that recipe in your head, continue reading in the book, and you're going to see all kinds of different ginger cookies. Same could be done for the sugar cookies. You're going to see some differences. I've got an old Dutch tea cake recipe in here that has a lot of flour in it, and it makes a lot of cookies. Um, But it's delicious. And who would have, you know, such basic ingredients. It's just delicious and so simple and pristine. Um, Then make something like the Jackson Jumbles, which would have been an 1830s recipe, which was the jumble recipe from the British with leavening added. And see how, and that was the, we're on the road to the tea cake here. And that would have been around the time, um, early 1800s, it was named for Andrew Jackson, because he was a man, a president who kind of did his own thing. And these cookies are, are, were revolutionary at the time, so to speak. They were different. Who would have thought about adding baking soda to, <laughs> to a jumble recipe? <laughs> and yet they're really lovely. Um, so I think, I think picking a sugar cookie type cookie, an old Dutch or an English recipe, the old jumbles, the Jackson jumbles, and then making something like, the, the tea cake, and I've got several tea cakes. I've got an um, old-fashioned tea cake, Victorian ginger tea cake, and, um, and an old um, Edenton, the Edenton Tea Party Cake, which is an old recipe that's been made new. Yum. Uh, I have to ask you the Sophie's Choice question. Yeah. Do, what, do you have a favorite? <laughs> Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, <laughs> it kind of it dep- it really depends. Yeah, I'm a chocolate girl. I think I think you know that. I love chocolate. Yeah, so, you mentioned chocolate uh, cake was your answer when we talked about cake. So yeah, yeah, I'm a chocolate girl. So so I really I love a good chocolate chip cookie. And I'll tell you, um, the original chocolate chip cookie recipe in this book is terrific. So that would have been the the one that was made at the Toll House in in Whitman, Massachusetts, and in the 1930s, and so it was. I love that it's Ruth Wakefield's chocolate crunch cookies, because that was a story where she ran out of baking cocoa and had to sub for her chocolate cookies and had to substitute just chop bar chocolate, and the rest is history. I like that recipe because it's delicious. And also, you can turn the whole thing into like a cast iron skillet and make this big old warm chocolate chip cookie thing too, out of that same recipe. So that's really good. Um, I also the, the lemon my lemon bar recipe in here, and I call it best ever. It really is. It's the <laughs> best. It's the best one. Um, I love Catherine Hepburn's brownie recipe that's in here. I like Emily Dickinson's rice cakes. They're like shortbread. Oh. They're really, really nice. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And and I think the ma- and the macaroon recipes and the mar- oh and the forgotten cookies. Have you ever, <laughs> have you ever baked forgotten cookies? I have not, but they're on my list now. <laughs> okay. They're a, mar- a chocolate meringue cookie that you actually leave in the oven, and when you leave them in the oven, they get real chewy and good. Mm. I love them. I am so grateful for this conversation uh, and probably you're curious about Anne's book. So American Cookie is available now wherever books are sold and it is a dangerous delight. I have already bookmarked like 30 recipes. (laughs) They're going to have to wait for me until it's a little cooler. It is too hot to turn the oven on right now. 
But you can keep up with Anne's work at her website at anneburn.com. That's A-N-N-E-B-Y-R-N.com. And she's on social media as at Anne Byrne, again, A-N-N-E-B-Y-R-N. Many, many thanks to Anne for chatting with me and sharing her insights and knowledge. I absolutely love every time I get to talk to her. She is just a delightful person. And even if she had nothing historical to talk about, I would still just want to hang out and talk with her. Uh, And again, I have a long list of recipes I want to make from that book. So for listener mail, I thought we would also include something that was about food. Um, It's a short one since uh, this interview is a little bit longer. It is from our listener, Taylor. And Taylor writes, I love listening to the podcast. Uh, This email is a little late. It only hit me recently that you might like to hear the story. I recently visited Scotland with some friends, and on our visit, we went to the town of Portree on the Isle of Skye. I may be mispronouncing that. My apologies if I am. That's me. Uh, I ordered a fish dish for dinner that night, and when it came, we were all perplexed by the sauce, for lack of a better word, that was on top. It was like nothing I'd ever tasted, and it was absolutely delicious. I asked the waitress what it was, and she said rarebit. She listed off what was in it and said it was a cheese sauce, quote, like in macaroni and cheese. This, of course, confused us Americans because, as one of my friends put it, quote, my cheese sauce comes dry in a packet from a box. Yes, for international listeners, that is the sad truth for many Americans. Um, But lots of people make their own cheese sauce with real cheese, just (laughs) FYI. Taylor writes, apart from committing the name to memory, we thought nothing more about it. Could you imagine my surprise when the very first podcast I listened to when I was back in the States was Windsor McKay Part 1? I immediately told my friends the info you had in the podcast on Rare Bit. They were very disappointed that I did not get to listen to it before the trip. And in case you were wondering, I did not have any strange dreams that night. So that is, of course, referring to the Windsor McKay comic strip, Dreams of a Rare Bit Fiend, which were uh, these fantastical stories all told on the presumption that the main character was having crazy dreams because he couldn't stop eating Rare Bit at, late at night before bed. Um, so thank you, Taylor. That sounds amazing. Uh, did you get a recipe for that Rare Bit? Because I'll try it. <laughs> I'll just add it to my list after the cookies. I love it. If anybody else has tried Rare Bit, true Rare Bit, I would love to hear a story about it, what it tasted like. Uh, I have had it, but it's been a while, and I always love a good cheese story. So if you would like to send us your cookies or your <laughs> rare bit or whatever, pictures, discussions, etc., you can do so at History Podcast at HowStuffWorks.com. We are also on social media as Missed in History pretty much everywhere. And we're at MissedInHistory.com if you want to check out the archives for all of the episodes of the show that have ever existed, including those from previous hosts. Uh, you should absolutely come and visit us at MissedInHistory.com, and you can subscribe to our our show, Stuff You Missed in History Class, on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 